It's dark out. A slender young woman leans on the railing of a ship, gliding through the Mediterranean. She squints. Her eyes hone in on the faint glow of lights blinking off the remote islands and seaside cities. They twinkle in the distance as if stars have fallen from the sky. Her childhood self would have never guessed that she would someday be floating out in the Mediterranean. And this isn't even her destination. A cool wind wraps around her body. It pulls at the coat she's been wearing for weeks and will have to wear for a few more. The wind pushes back her crescent moon bangs on her forehead. The moon is all she can see right now. Maybe it surprises her that this golden orb pinned above her is the same one she stares at thousands of miles away when she's home in New York. The moon will be her only constant as she slowly circumnavigates the globe. And she's grateful for the moon and her consistency because this woman's journey will be anything but stable. She will explore markets in Egypt and eat incredible curry in Ceylon. She'll walk through an execution hall in Canton and drive a train in Arizona. She will buy a monkey. She will find kindness where she least expects it and will roll her eyes through every marriage proposal. She will always wish she had more time, but appreciates that she got to be there at all. As the steamship drifts by small continental towns, this woman thinks about all the lives she's passing by. Millions of other people whose lives have nothing to do with her own, no matter how many newspapers sell, with her name printed on the front. But she rides on the thrill of it all. She feels alive in a way she's never felt before. She is as boundless as the sea that undulates beneath her and is already addicted to the feeling of being in motion, even if the whole adventure frightens her. Now this woman is used to being a little scared. As an undercover journalist, her work has put her in danger over and over and over again just to get a good story, and it's always been worth it. But her fears about this trip are kept at bay when she refocuses on her mission. This woman's name is Nellie Bly, and she's on a mission to travel the world in under 80 days. Now, my name is Adrian Bain, and the more time I spend reading Nellie's story, I can't help but think of my own adventures, even though her story predates mine by 134 years. I've also stood on a deck of an overnight boat in the Mediterranean and have had sea salt skate across my tongue. I know what it feels like to be thousands of miles from home and know that every swell of the ocean is taking me even further. I've woken up in new places and have had no idea where I will be tomorrow. But I have been lucky to explore at a time when traveling solo as a woman is a little bit more acceptable. Some will always think I'll be taken hostage when I go abroad. Others ask if I've gotten permission from my boyfriend to go. But for the most part, I have been incredibly blessed to see so much of this earth and fall in love with many of the incredible people who live here. I've hitchhiked through Europe, motorbiked through Asia, driven across the States, and trekked through Latin America. I've taken 20-hour bus rides and curled up for 18-hour flights. 
I owe my own reckless adventures to Nellie Bly. And if Nellie did have a night on the boat like the one I'm imagining, it's safe to say that she wasn't thinking about how she is laying the groundwork for bold female travelers like myself, especially at a time when her adventure is unfathomable. She can't yet comprehend the unique place in history she will one day occupy. She only cared about one thing, getting her story. And she would be the one to tell it in her voice. So on that night, she takes one last salty breath, catches the moon's glow one more time, and heads down to her cabin to be rocked into a deep sleep. Who knows where she will be tomorrow? I'm Adrian Bain, and this is Strangers Abroad Presents A Race Around the World, based on the true story of Nellie Bly. So, how did this unlikely woman end up so far from home? As a child, Nellie probably didn't even think that being a journalist was an option. And she wasn't Nellie Bly yet. She was still going by her given name, Elizabeth Jane Cochran. Elizabeth Jane was born in 1864 in a small Appalachia town, Apollo, Pennsylvania. And as a kid, Elizabeth Jane was a natural storyteller. She made up stories between school lessons and told them to other children. She often upset her teachers because Elizabeth Jane had a certain energy about her. She was headstrong, imaginative, and loud, which was very unattractive for a girl back then. One teacher noted that Elizabeth had more righteous conduct than professional scholarship. But Elizabeth didn't care. If she wasn't telling stories, she read anything she could get her hands on. Her need for stories was like her need for bread and warmth. And it was a need that her parents tried to dress up and ignore. Mary Jane, Elizabeth's mom, loved dressing up her first daughter in magentas, rosewoods, and fuchsias, which gave Elizabeth the nickname Pink. Maybe her mom thought that her willful daughter would never have the adventurous life she was made for. So at least Pink could stand out in a sea of brown clothing. From day one, Pink aspired to be more than average. But then tragedy struck. When Pink was six, now the middle child out of five siblings, her father, Michael, died and somehow forgot to write his wife, Mary Jane, into his will. So Michael Cochran's inheritance was divided between other relatives first, which left Mary Jane and her five children with table scraps by the end. Pink and her siblings were taken out of school to help pay rent and put food on the table. Mary Jane needed security and fast, which for a woman at that time could only come in the form of a husband. So Mary Jane quickly remarried a man in Apollo who quickly drank away any savings that Mary Jane needed to keep raising her five children. Now, living with her new stepfather, it was harder for Pink to read at home because of his fights with her mother and his non-stop drinking, which eventually turned into abuse. Pink saw firsthand how her mother had a crippling dependency on her stepfather and it made her furious. 
But Mary Jane wasn't completely submissive. One day, either the drinking got too bad or the beatings became too rageful. But after five grueling years of being together, Mary Jane filed for divorce. Getting a divorce wasn't just hard or uncommon, but it was unimaginable. And if the person filing for divorce was a woman, it was even harder. Wives filing for divorce had to testify in court why they didn't want to be with their husbands in front of a room of only men, including the husband she was trying to divorce which is exactly what Mary Jane had to do. And even then, Mary Jane's words weren't enough. She needed others who had witnessed the abuse to come forward and advocate for her. Pink was now 14 and considered a woman. She was old enough to bleed and old enough to testify in court on her mother's behalf. Pink sat through her mother's testimony and then her terrible stepfather's testimony and eventually took the stand herself. As she sat down in that cold chair, Pink began to spin a yarn in front of all of those men. At some point during her oration, Pink had a vision. She mentally zoomed out and saw herself sitting in that courtroom when she should have been sitting in a classroom. In that room, on that cold chair, Pink saw what her life would be like if she too had to depend on men. My father forgot to leave a will behind. That's the only reason my mother had to marry this terrible drunk. She recounts her stepfather's abuse. She deserves someone who is kind and will take care of her. She felt all of the men's eyes in the courtroom burn into her, knowing that they only saw her as a woman, a breeder, someone less than, as she sat there pleading for their sympathy. Please, please grant my mother a divorce. Whatever Pink said, it tipped the scales. We will grant you this divorce. Oh, th thank goodness. And the two women held each other as they left the courtroom. Only eight years after her father died, Pink knew everything she needed to know about Victorian men. They died earlier than women, they left them little, they could get drunk and abusive between birth and death. From that moment forward, Pink promised herself that she would never rely on a man's money to support herself. But Mary Jane's plight wasn't over yet. Divorce at that time was extremely stigmatized. So now a widow and a divorcee Mary Jane left for Pittsburgh and took her children with her. It wasn't Paris, but it was better than rural Pennsylvania. For the next few years, the whole family worked odd jobs to keep their heads above water, but under the thick smog of the manufacturing town. Pink was often a kitchen girl, a nanny, or sometimes a cleaning lady. These low-wage jobs were her only option. Pink had little time off from this long, hard, and boring fate. I don't want to be taking care of other people's children or cleaning up after them. I want to explore. I want to see the world. And through all of this, she still loved telling and reading stories. They were the only thing that distracted her from her reality. She made up stories about faraway places as she scrubbed floors, cleaned up after someone else's child, or tried to go to sleep. Six years ticked by, and Pink is now 21. No matter how hard the day, Pink always spends a few cents on a local paper and reads it cover to cover with whatever energy she has left over. 
Then one day, in mid-January of 1885, Pink read something that made her pause. She cracks open the local paper, the Pittsburgh Dispatch, and reads every line from the headlines to the ad copy. She turns the pages, and her eyes fall onto an opinion piece about what to do with unwed women. The column was written by Erasmus Wilson, whose pen name was The Quiet Observer. However, Wilson did not have quiet opinions about unwed women. A woman's sphere is defined and located by a single word, home. Women who worked outside of the home were a monstrosity. There's no greater abnormality than a woman in breeches, unless it is a man in petticoats. Pink's eyes soak up every word. Her anger starts to warm her body on this frigid January day. She sits back in her chair. She feels the hard wood on her sore lower back from picking up other people's children or cleaning their homes all day. She knows how much her, her mother, and other women had to work. Instead of turning the page, Pink calls bullshit. Pink grabs the closest piece of paper to her. Fueled by injustice and female hormones, Pink starts to write out her own observations. My mother did not ask for my father to die and leave her nothing. My mother did not ask for her second husband to be a drunk. Not to mention screw housework. I want to get my hands covered in ink, not soap suds. I want to tell stories. I want to have adventures. Who is this quiet observer to tell me otherwise? Steam comes off her pen. Pink writes until her hand cramps and she keeps going. When she's done, she signs the letter with her own pseudonym, Lonely Orphan Girl. And this might sound like a dramatic ploy to get someone to read her response, but I think she knows that as a female, this letter might not get read at all. So she signs it with a name that the editors couldn't ignore. Pink walks to the nearest post office, mails in her letter, and returns to work as usual. The next day, on January 17th, 1885, George Mason, the editor of the Pittsburgh Dispatch, printed a request asking the writer calling themselves Lonely Orphan Girl to come into his office. While Pink is flipping through the newspaper, she eventually stumbles upon the request, and her face matches her nickname. Oh, wow, what, what is this about? Pink bundles up in her best clothing and heads to the Pittsburgh Dispatch. When she comes in, she asks the secretary, Um, hello, I am, uh, I'm looking for the editor at the Pittsburgh Dispatch. I'm the lonely orphan girl. Pink keeps her head low as the secretary escorts her to the editor's office. She walks through the packed newspaper room with writers typing away. She gazes at the spaced out tables with long easels and typewriters, giving writers enough space to dig into a beat. Journalists shout out half-bitten ideas that float through the air and dissipate like tobacco smoke. Eavesdropped clues fall to the ground like burnt ashes. This room alone proves that the strength of the steel-tipped pen can kill more people than a well-sharpened blade. Her heart beats in rhythm to the sound of journalists working away. She doesn't cough from all the cigar smoke and testosterone in the room. Pink is riveted, watching and listening as sights and sounds inharmoniously clash together the way instruments tune before a performance. With her auburn curls resting on her shoulders, her femininity must have been striking compared to the frantic masculinity filling the room. She arrives at the editor's door, 
and the secretary knocks. And when it opens, on the other side of the desk is a young man editing away. The editor smiles and welcomes Pink. Oh, thank goodness. I thought he was going to be some old grouch about to lecture me. Well, hello. Come in, come in. Hello, hi. What is your real name? Um, my name is Elizabeth Jane Cochran. We are quite impressed with your writing. I can't believe such a fiery piece came from such a meek young woman. We aren't going to publish the letter you wrote, but we were wondering if you were interested in writing an official piece about the women's sphere, and we would pay you for it. Have me do what? Write about the women's... what? And get paid for it? How do I go about... Right? Just say yes, just say yes, and you'll figure it out. Of course. I believe we can work something out. A few days later, in her official submission, it was clear that her grammar and punctuation were terrible. But her voice is propulsive and strong. Her retort directly addresses the most judgmental and myopic aspects of the Quiet Observer's original piece. Can they, that have full and plenty of this world's goods, Realize what it is to be a poor working woman, abiding in one or two bare rooms without fire enough to keep warm, while her threadbare clothes refuse to protect her from the wind and cold, and deny herself the necessary food that her little ones may not go hungry, fearing the landlord's frown and the threat to cast her out and sell what little she has, begging for employment of any kind that she may earn enough to pay for the bare rooms she calls home, no one to speak kindly to or engage her, nothing to make her life worth the living. Pink's answer to the quiet observer is to give unwed women an education and equal job opportunity. It will be better for individual women and society at large. When Pink's piece is published, Mason is impressed. He could tell she is a born writer and officially hires her at the Pittsburgh Dispatch. I hope Pink was a little smug on her first day when she walked by Erasmus's desk. Since Wilson published his misogynistic ideas about how women should stay home, he unintentionally put a woman in the workforce. But before she can become a groundbreaking journalist, she needs a name, something catchy. And as the legend goes, Elizabeth and Mason hem and haw over a catchy nom de plume. How about Amelia Applegate? Well, I don't see myself as an Amelia. As they sit in Mason's office, hours and names go by. I could be called Liza LaRue. I'm not sure. It sounds a little uh, romantic. I've got it. We could call you Carol Smithers. Well, <laughs> that one's not exactly uh, memorable. Until an office boy walks by singing a popular tune titled Nellie Bly. Now that's got a ring to it. That's not too bad. So let's pretend she does a Cinderella twist. And voila, Nellie Bly is born. Now as Nellie, she will not be picking up any more brooms with her new name. Instead, She'll be uncovering stories that were trying to be swept under the rug. It's an understatement to say that being a female journalist was rare back then. Only 2% of journalists in America were women at the time. And 99% of those female journalists reported on women's issues. So sorry, not voting rights or the suffrage movement, or God forbid, birth control. Most lady writers are confined to the home sphere. That is where they worked and what they wrote about. Female writers wrote about homesteading, recipes, 
and high society fashion. But Nellie is not interested in any of that. Instead, Nellie decides to step out of the suffocating box of the women's sphere and do journalism, which she has a natural talent for. She is exceptional at making others comfortable enough to talk to her, and she uses her new platform for good. In her articles for the Pittsburgh Dispatch, she advocates for poor women and demands they get more resources. She goes undercover as a female factory worker and writes about local corruption. She pitches herself to go on a hot air balloon ride with Joseph Pulitzer of the New York World newspaper. Sadly, she never hears a reply. Nellie works night and day, constantly looking for a better story. She works so hard, she becomes a staple reporter at the Pittsburgh Dispatch and even charms Erasmus into a little friendship. This is everything I have wanted to do. I can do this for the rest of my life. And she wants to go as far as she can. Like when she hears that a one-way train can bring her straight down to Mexico City. That's a spectacular idea. Nellie rushes into Mason's office the next day and pitches her idea. I'll travel south of the border and write about my experiences. Mason peers down his glasses and tells her that she is mad. Nellie, have you lost your mind? Traveling to Mexico? It's far too dangerous for a woman. Why, even for the bravest American man. Well, just think about all that money you could make if you sent a woman, like myself, down to Mexico. <sighs> and soon enough, Nellie finds herself on a ride down to the modern heart of the Aztec Empire with her mom. Nellie stares out the window and sees the thick Appalachian trees begin to thin out. The air gets hotter and the sun gets brighter. Once she's in Mexico City, the dense industry fog lifts and Nellie breathes easy. She is fascinated by the jungle foliage, the prickly cactuses, the stretching palm trees, and the bushy Mexican cypresses. There's endless music on the streets, outdoor markets selling a rainbow of fruits and vegetables she's never heard of. Brujas peddle their remedies next to the butcher. Nellie falls in love with Mexico City like it is a person. She notices all of its textures and subtleties. For five months, Nellie brings the readers of the Pittsburgh Dispatch stories about theater, street music, tombs, bullfighting, and festivals. She diffuses the stereotypes around Mexico and writes about how kind and hardworking the locals are. And she talks about how safe it is for an American woman traveling alone. The free American girl can accommodate herself to circumstances without the aid of a man. So she starts sifting through what she really wants out of life and begins to envision her full potential. My life can be full of adventures if I just dig deeper into my work. I want to open the world like a mango and let the juice run down my face. She gets a taste of the world beyond Pittsburgh. How on earth can I get more of this? When Nellie returns to the States, she knows something's got to give. She needs a bigger challenge. So when Nellie comes into the office of the Pittsburgh Dispatch, she tells Erasmus Wilson her four goals in life. One, to work for a New York newspaper. Two, to reform the world. Three, to fall in love. And four, to marry a millionaire. She believes 
she can accomplish anything with her new mantra. Energy rightly applied and directed will accomplish anything. So she has to move to New York in order to start striking some of these goals off her list. And one day in April of 1887, she didn't come into work. All that's left behind is a note on Erasmus's desk. I am off for New York. Look out for me. Bye. Adios, muchachos. Nellie arrives in the Big Apple, focused on her first goal, to become a New York journalist. She brings letters of recommendation, samples of her writings, her life savings, and big ideas. The way many of us arrive in New York, our big dreams usually take up most of the space in our luggage. And then, our small apartments. The only luxury Nellie allows herself to bring is a small, thin gold band she wears on her left thumb, and she has a nervous habit of twisting it. She rents a room on 96th Street, but is still miles from where she needs to be. The newspaper district is in Park Row, next to City Hall and Wall Street. Sure, moving to New York will be a challenge, but if she could get a job in Pittsburgh as a woman, then she could totally get a job in New York, arguably a more progressive city. And being a female investigative journalist is rare. She'll have a job in no time. Nellie goes down to Park Row every day and takes it on like a knight battling a dragon. She waltzes into every newspaper office and tries to get an interview with any editor she can find. She goes in with a straight back, hands editors her letters of recommendation and copies of her pieces, only to be turned away again and again and again for months. Every editor scoffs at her and tells her to move along. Female journalists could not, with any accuracy, describe the feelings of the profession because they were perfectly suited for society, fashion, and general gossip. Women could write, but not well. (laughs) Best use of their right would be to send to their husbands who are dispatched on important missions. Well, we aren't opposed to hiring women. We have two on staff. We will send you a note if we need any assistance. Spring turns into summer and still no bites. But New York has never given anyone anything easily. But when summer fades into fall, the reality of how lofty Nellie's dreams are starts to sink in. She's living alone, far from her family, hustling every day and not making much traction. She lives off of money she made back in Pittsburgh. And her life savings, that she carries around with her everywhere she goes, starts to get thin. She carries it around because it's the safest place to keep it. At this time, women are not allowed to open bank accounts without a man's assistance and they wouldn't be able to do it alone for another 80 years. Being in New York is much harder than she anticipated. But journalism is her North Star. I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. Until she gets robbed. On a warm September day in 1887, Five months into living in New York, Nellie steps off the elevated train by her apartment. She slips her hand into her pocket and notices that all of her money is gone. 
not just her train fare, but all of her life savings. Oh God, where did it go? What happened? How could I be so mindless? But Nellie isn't one to wallow. She churns her frustration into fuel and books it down to the newspaper district. I am not leaving Park Row until I get a job. When she arrives at Park Row, she knows exactly which paper she will strong arm into giving her a job. Gone are the days when she pussyfoots around waiting for letters. She blinks and finds herself sitting in front of John Cockrell's door at the New York World, waiting to give him her pitch. The Nelly, sitting in front of Cockrell's door, is not the same Nelly that timidly entered the Pittsburgh dispatch. She wants to prove that she can accomplish all of the goals on her list and is ready to take her biggest leap yet. As she sits in the New York World office, listening to the journalists type away, Nellie wants nothing more than to be in there with all the boys, even though the glass ceiling is still miles above her head. When I envision Nellie sitting outside that door, I see every woman back then who never followed her dreams. Instead, she's quietly stirring stew at home, hunched over in a sewing factory, or massaging her chapped nipples, thinking that this is all there was to life. But Nellie knew that her life would be different. As Nellie waits for Cockrell to open his door, she refines her pitch, muttering to herself over and over again, looking like a madwoman. But now is the time to be bold and direct, because she doesn't have many other options. Nellie chooses the New York world for two reasons. First, when she spoke to Cockrell months earlier, he told her, Well, we aren't opposed to hiring women. We have two on staff. We will send you a note if we need any assistance. And secondly, Joseph Pulitzer owns the New York world and is a shrewd and neurotic businessman. However, he wants pieces published that advocate for the poor and voice the voiceless. So maybe Nellie thought that out of all of the editors, Cockrell is the most receptive to her ideas and her plight. She smooths her dress out for the thousandth time. And eventually, Cockrell gets curious and lets this patient young woman into his office. She steps in. This is her moment. But then her feelings override everything she's prepared. And she begins to spew her guts. Uh, hel uh, hello, I'm Elizabeth Jane Cochran, pen name Nellie Bly. I've reported for the Pittsburgh Dispatch. Um, I've I've pitched to you before once, but um, I, I'm back because I need a job and I am good at what I do. I've gone undercover in factories. I took a train down to Mexico once and lived with the locals and exposed corrupt government officials. When I was 14, I had to testify for my mother's divorce against my drunken stepfather. You see, my father died when I was six and uh, my mom had to remarry. So, oh, actually, I once tried to work for Pulitzer when he was doing that whole hot air balloon ride in, in um, Missouri. Anyways, I have a series of pitches for you that I think you should consider. First, I could take a boat across the Atlantic and see the conditions of how immigrants coming to America are treated. I hear that they're dirty and overcrowded and perfect for spreading typhoid, which is exactly what the tenement buildings are like. See, my family is Irish. They moved to Western Pennsylvania at the turn of the century, so I think I can As do a bit of an As listens, Nellie cannot read his face. And the reason I am here today is because, honestly, all of my money got stolen this morning and I, I really need a job. Once she's done, she's gone on such a rant, she blacked out a little bit and can't really remember what she just said. Cockrell sits back. He tilts his head 
and looks at this plucky young woman. Cockrell has the reputation of being a great editor because he is ruthless and has an eye for talent. And he must have seen that in Nellie. So he says, No. As she stands above his desk, he looks her in the eye and levels with her. Look, if I'm going to hire you, I'm not going to send you across the Atlantic immediately. That's not how we do things here. I need you to do a local piece. I'm sorry about your robbery, so here's $25 to hold you over, and we can return to this Atlantic Ocean idea another day. Because it is intriguing. We'll keep you on retainer. Good. But that's it. Just an idea on retainer. Cockrell takes another pause. How about instead of going overseas, you get into an insane asylum? Uh, Oh, um, I believe I can. A year goes by. And a year after Nellie broke herself in and out of an insane asylum, Nellie's life is exactly what she wanted it to be. She works for the New York World newspaper full time, and her writings have reformed the city. Her reports have encouraged the New York City government to send more funding to the poor and vulnerable in the city. She's gone undercover and exposed corrupt institutions, businessmen, and politicians. She once went ghost hunting and met Helen Keller. In the year that she works for the New York World, she receives marriage proposals, death threats, and remedies for her chronic headaches. She becomes so popular, other women pretend to be her. What Nellie has accomplished is unbelievable. And I mean that in its original sense. People did not believe that women could do what she is doing. And she doesn't even have a high school education. But she does have three things. Intuition, talent, and hustle. Now Nellie's mantra is truer than ever. Energy rightly applied and directed can accomplish anything. Nellie makes enough money to get a nicer place closer to her work. So she moves to West 36th Street between 9th and 10th Ave and even invites her mother to come live with her. Nellie gives her mom what so many men failed to do. Real security. When Nellie isn't spending days undercover, she has a bit of a ritual. She spends Sundays dreaming up pitches. So one fall day in 1888, Nellie can't think of anything. She's at a point where every pitch has to outdo itself, like an addict, slowly increasing the strength of their drug. She looks down at her notepad, just filled with scratched out ideas. Maybe I could disguise myself as a cleaning lady and see what the Rockefellers are up to. I could ride this new bicycle with two wheels that are the same size. Uh, gosh, I don't know. Maybe I could try to find, um, the best Italian cheese? Ugh. Nellie loves journalism, but this is exhausting. Goodness, I have nothing. At the ripe old age of 24, Nellie is burning out like an old gas canister. Morning turns into afternoon, which blends into the evening. By bedtime, Nellie doesn't have a single pitch to bring to Cockrell the next day. The muse is absent. When Nellie crawls into bed, she starts to panic about the impending doom coming for her at daybreak, which just keeps her up longer. Once she admits she can't fall asleep, 
Nellie goes up and looks out her window. I wish I was up there with the moon, away from this pressure and stress. I'm sure it's so quiet up there. Oh, I'm so tired. What I wouldn't give for a vacation or at least a day off. I don't want to face Cockrell tomorrow. I wish I could take a vacation on the other side of the planet. Wait, she sits up. Her back straightens. Wait, that's it. That, that's a great idea. Tomorrow, I'll give one pitch to go around the world. That's a little too vague still. What was that? Wasn't there a book around the... Something about 80. Something about around the world in 80 days. Around the world in 80 days. <gasps> around the world in 80 days. I'll see if it can be done. Somehow in her quasi-lucid state, Nellie comes up with her wildest idea yet. Oh, now I can't sleep. But the thought of having something to bring to the office the next day finally brings her some peace and rest. The next morning, she heads off to the steamship company's office. She takes calendars, maps, and timetables from every corner of the globe and looks back and forth and back and forth. Her finger traces over oceans, countries, and continents, places that are so far away, people can only get there in a dream or a painting. Brindisi, Aden, Singapore, Hong Kong, Yokohama, San Francisco. When Nellie pieces it all together, she sees that her plan can actually work. She can go around the world in 80 days, and maybe even less. In a flurry, she grabs all of her papers and rushes to the New York World office. When she gets to Cockrell's door, he asks her if she has any ideas. Yes, I do. Just one. Cockrell fiddles with his pens, and Nellie notices the dust particles floating in a sunbeam. I want to go around the world in 80 days or less. I think I can beat Jules Verne's fictional record. May I try it? Cockrell leans back in his chair. Someone else had that idea already, and it didn't really go anywhere. I'm not going to lie, it's probably safer to send a man. How about you go speak with the business manager? That's the office equivalent of go ask your mother. The newspaper's business manager, George Turner, is not as coy as Cockrell when Nellie broaches the topic. It's impossible for you to do it. In the first place, you're a woman and would need a protector. And even if it were possible for you to travel alone, you would need to carry so much baggage that it would detain you in making rapid changes. Besides, you speak nothing but English. So there is no use talking about it. No one but a man can do this. Nellie's skin is as thick as a rhinoceros's hide by then, but her blood starts to boil because who Who are you to tell me that I can't do this? You're just some pencil pusher who sits behind a desk and moves some coins around. I have done real reporting that is dangerous for either sex, not to mention my writing has helped sell so many papers. But she really says... Very well. Start the man. And I'll start the same day for some other newspaper and beat him. Maybe Turner knew he had gone too far. And all he says is... Uh, I believe you would. He levels. Look, if we decide to do this piece, we will send you. But not now. That's not reassuring. Nellie leaves the office in a huff. And the idea starts to collect dust. But not much. Months on the calendar flip by. By now, it was 1889. Benjamin Harrison is president, straws are invented, and Van Gogh is just about to chop his ear off. Nellie returns to her regular beat, but her around-the-world idea seems to have tapped into some collective consciousness. Because for the next year, Cockrell keeps getting the same pitch. And then, 
Pulitzer catches wind that another newspaper might send a man around the world. During this time, there was a dip in Pulitzer's sales, and he's getting a little nervous. So he looks for a long-standing piece that could keep his papers in the hands of his readers. And what would sell more papers than a man going around the world? All of these forces are enough for Pulitzer to pull the trigger on a starting pistol. In the late afternoon of Monday, November 12, 1889, Nellie is at her home and gets an urgent note from Cockrell to come to his office immediately. She is taken aback and rushes into his office, twisting her ring on her thumb. Did I write something that upset somebody? Is the paper being sued? What could this be about? She opens Cockrell's door, only to find him calm, taking notes at his desk. Hmm. He doesn't seem upset. So she sits down and waits for him to tell her what's going on. His calmness makes her uneasy. Then he cocks his head up. Can you start around the world the day after tomorrow? I can start this minute! For the next hour, they hem and haw over the details, and Nellie and Cockrell decide that she will go on the Augusta Victoria steamship on November 14th, leaving New York Harbor at 9.30 a.m. She spins on her heels and leaves. From this moment until November 14th at 9.30 in the morning, every second counts because she only has 55 hours until departure. Nellie loves riding the thrill of being pressed for time. She brings her can-do attitude to the biggest obstacle first. Get a travel gown ready by the night of the 13th. This could not just be any gown. It needs to withstand every kind of weather, temperature, and climate. It will be her only gown for the next... who knows how long. On the morning of the 13th, she enters the shop of a fashionable dressmaker. She walks up to him. He has pins in his mouth, and he's deciding between two cloths. Hello. Um, I would like a travel gown by this evening. His body doesn't move, but his eyes look up at her. Very well. After thumbing through a number of fabrics, he chooses a plaid camel hair as the most durable and suitable material. While Nellie is having an enjoyable fitting, the world office is frantic. The first thing they do is send an editor to Washington to get Nellie an emergency passport. The other editors have to plan an 80-day world tour in under 48 hours. So as they look through timetables, maps, and calendars, The seams in this plan are pulled tight, like the stitches on Nellie's new dress. These editors put their heads together and sketch out the fastest itinerary. Ideally, Nellie will never touch the continent of Asia. Instead, she will hopscotch along all of the islands. This is the plan. November 14th, she will leave New York. By November 21st, she will be in London. By the 23rd, she'll be in Paris, and on the 25th, she'll be in Brindisi, Italy. On the 27th, she'll be cruising in the Suez Canal, and by December 10th, she will be in Ceylon. She'll arrive in Singapore on December 18th. Christmas, she'll spend in Hong Kong. She will ring in the new year in Yokohama, Japan, and then be back in San Francisco by January 22nd. The last leg of her journey is to take a train across the United States. She is due back in New York by January 27th. And by this route, the trip isn't 80 days. Nellie can do it in 75. 
And this is the plan that the world publishes. In the print-up of this adventure, the New York world advertises it as a way to test modern technology and transportation. Nellie will receive no special treatment, no special trains or express ships. She will only travel as a first-class passenger around the world. The world newspaper really wants to see if someone can circumnavigate the globe in under 80 days by normal means. Although I'm sure the wad of British banknotes in her pocket will help her be more comfortable. Nellie's goal is to investigate the hardships of the modern traveler and will report back with suggestions on how to improve travel from the passenger's perspective. This is all to deviate away from the idea that this is just some big publicity stunt. Which it totally is. By the nightfall of the 13th, the dress is made, the plan is set, the passport is on its way, as is the Augusta Victoria steamship. And sadly, Nellie cannot take her mom on this journey but she's secretly excited that she gets to be alone. She doesn't want anyone to slow her down. She holds these thoughts at bay the night before she leaves. She spends that whole time trying to pack her belongings into one grip sack. She only wants to bring what she can carry, just in case she has to sprint from one connection to the other. And when her second dress doesn't fit into her grip sack, Nellie faces a dilemma. Bring another bag or travel for three months in one dress. I will show that business manager I don't need a million trunks. Her spite pushes her to ditch the dress. There is no better way to become a minimalist than when you have to carry your home with you. Once Nellie is tired of fussing with everything, she tucks herself into bed for her early boat the next morning, leaving Jersey City. Day one, November 14th. When her alarm goes off, Nellie peels herself out of bed, which suddenly feels so comfortable knowing that she's not going to be in it for a while. Her mom, Mary Jane, didn't get much sleep either. Mary Jane makes breakfast. It's the last meal she'll make for her daughter for some time. Nellie tries to stomach it so early in the morning, she can barely swallow because she is pregnant on nerves and excitement Exhaustion and anticipation with a tinge of sadness. She has as many feelings as there are fish in the ocean that she is about to sail over. The last moment at home comes and she hugs her mother tightly. There was a hasty kiss and a blind rush downstairs trying to overcome the hard lump in my throat that threatened to make me regret the journey that lay before me. Nellie can't bring herself to say goodbye to her mother. Instead, only think of me as having a vacation and the most enjoyable time in my life. Suddenly, she doesn't want to go, but she knows she has to. Nellie forces herself out of her apartment and hits the streets of New York. The morning light is buttery and melts over the city. It looks so beautiful in a way she's never appreciated before. Her leather bag is strapped to her back over the only dress and coat she will wear for the foreseeable future. Nellie gets on the elevated train down to the pier and the quick ride feels like a lifetime. When she gets off at Christopher Street, she steps on the ferry to Hoboken. The faint smell of salt water hits her nose. It mixes in with the cold November air. She blinks 
and suddenly the boat is softly bumping into land. She offboards with all the other passengers going to work on this regular Thursday. For Nellie, her job today is to go around the world. She goes down to the dock where the great Augusta Victoria is idly sitting at 475 feet long in the bay. The length of five blue whales lined tip to tail with three tall cylinder pipes on top. The ship is a mobile city. The morning was bright and beautiful and everything seemed pleasant while the boat was still. When they warned me to go ashore, I began to realize what was meant for me. Nellie looks out into the harbor and spots a number of cargo ships bringing imports from all over the planet, places that seem closer than ever. She slowly twists her ring. It's the only luxury she's allowed herself to bring. Hopefully, it will keep the fates in her favor. Where on one hand she has luck, on the other is time. She has a leather band wrapped around her wrist with a self-winding watch looped through it. She will use it to be on local time. She has another 24-hour gold-plated watch stuffed into the bowels of her bag that is set to New York time. She can always check in and see what time it is at home. The few friends and colleagues that came to see her off stand around her on this gray Jersey morning and Nellie is about to see the world in full color. A stoic man walks up to her from the New York Athletic Club. He's the timekeeper and is there to mark the exact second when Nellie's journey begins. The captain of the Augusta Victoria approaches her and introduces himself. Tell me about this trip around the world you're going on. Nellie, in all of her excitement, word vomits, I shall take no sleep until we reach London. Well then, we shall prepare you some tea. We'll be leaving shortly. The captain smirks. He nods his head and heads back to the ship. He knows the pre-trip jitters all too well. At this point, Nellie's heart is jumping into her throat. She can't have a real conversation because her nerves have taken over and it dawns on her the insanity of what she is about to do. She pushes down the tears and tries not to show her true fear. Why am I leaving? Why am I leaving? I am so at home here. I don't know anything about where I'm about to go. I don't speak another language. Wait, wait, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. I love everyone here. Why am I leaving? The reporters and her friends give her a pat on the back and a final hug. Then she walks up the gangplank. She feels the weight of the task at hand and tries to soothe herself. It's only 25,000 miles. It's only 25,000 miles. It's only 25,000 miles. When she gets on the ship, She goes out onto the deck to see New York from a distance. And Nellie is alone. The ship slowly pulls out of the harbor and away from everything Nellie has ever known. She feels dizzy, a little lost. Her heart feels like it's about to burst. 75 days, that's a lifetime. And now her trip feels like it's just a long distance with no end. As the ship pulls out of the harbor, both Nellie and the man from the New York Athletic Club synchronize their watches. On Thursday, November 14th, 1889, at 9 a.m. 40 minutes and 30 seconds, I started on my tour around the world. I am off. 
Shall I ever return? Nellie starts to itemize everything that could go wrong or kill her. With all of the anxiety and getting up too early and not getting enough sleep, then saying goodbye to everyone she loves and now being alone, Nellie starts to feel her breakfast on the move as well. She runs over to the boat's side and releases her anxiety and breakfast into the ocean. She looks up as New York starts to get smaller. What Nellie is about to do is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a woman, especially. And little did she know that she would not be the only woman to leave New York that day to race around the world. A Race Around the World was written, produced, researched, narrated, scripted, edited, edited again, rescripted, soundscaped, scored, and voiced by me, Adrian Bain. Sam Dingman was our editorial consultant and emotional support. Erasmus Wilson was played by Terrence Dalton. The Judge was played by Fabian Martinez Sanchez. George Mason, the business manager and editor number one, was played by Sam Dingman. Editor number two was played by Nick Markovitz. John Cockrell was played by Jonathan Tenace. Father Time was played by Jake Dingman. This show was researched and based on the books 80 Days by Matthew Goodman, Around the World in 72 Days and Other Writings by Nellie Bly, and Pulitzer, A Life by Dennis Bryan. For more resources and readings that helped bring the show alive, head to the website strangersabroadpodcast.com and search for A Race Around the World. Please subscribe, rate, and review this show. And if you would like to leave an email or leave a review, I will read it on the Ye Old TikToks, and you can go to Strangers Abroad Podcast on TikTok for bonus content that didn't make it into the show. Please email strangersabroadpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and come back next week for another leg in the adventure of Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland. Safe travels to everyone out there. <laughs>